Hello and welcome to this special show on Rajya Sabha Television. I am Vishal Dahiya and here we talk about uh, the battle against COVID-19 pandemic. Now, there are various aspects starting from drugs to vaccines which are being talked about and obviously, you know, the ways we can protect ourselves. But uh, there is one very important uh, aspect to this uh, fight against COVID-19 pandemic and that is uh, the comorbidity factor. Now, that becomes really important and the numbers also tell us that, uh, you know, if a patient is comorbid, that is, if uh, he or she already has uh, more than one disease before they get infected with COVID-19, then the situation might become a little more difficult for such patients. We'll try and understand this entire relation between comorbidity and the COVID-19 pandemic and also how we can tackle this particular factor, what is being done on the ground, both by the health workers and uh, for patients as well, for general people like us, what can we do before the situation starts getting out of hand? And for more on this, uh, we are joined by a distinguished panel of guests. Let me first introduce them to you, beginning with Dr. Santa Sabushtas. He is a scientist F with ICMR Kolkata. We also have with us uh, Dr. Anil Gurthu, director, professor and uh, head of the Department of Medicine at Lady Harding Medical College. And we also have uh, Dr. Rohit Sarin with us, who is a member of the National Task Force on COVID-19. Welcome, all of you gentlemen, to Rajya Sabha Television. Okay, let me first bring in uh, Dr. Das here to try and, uh, you know, take a perspective with, with uh, the facts and figures and the numbers which might throw a bit more light on uh, this relationship between comorbidity and the COVID-19 virus. Dr. Das? Yeah, uh, thank you, Vijal, for inviting me to this very important discussion on comorbidities and COVID-19. Um, you know, as uh, this is now a common knowledge that COVID-19 is particularly um, uh, severe and um, uh, life-threatening when it is associated with some uh, comorbid with some other diseases which are called comorbidities. So, in an otherwise healthy uh, young individuals, uh, they even if they uh, show some symptoms uh, and signs, they in most cases they recover without uh, much consequences. But uh, when it is uh, associated with some uh, other diseases, like particularly chronic diseases like uh, hypertension, diabetes, or somebody having cancer and on chemotherapy, somebody ha having pre-existing lung diseases or some liver or uh, chronic liver or kidney diseases. So these are the diseases which we know that they are uh, all common uh, with increasing age. Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps that is another reason why COVID-19 is particularly uh, severe and fatal in elderly population, other than uh, age being itself uh, a, a, a little bit of a, a, a risk factor uh, mm -hmm. for more severe disease. So, okay. uh, as you just mentioned that, you know, it's like around a little over 17% uh, as was uh, as was mentioned by our uh, Honorable Health Minister, uh, when it is associated with uh, the case fatality rate is uh, 17, little over 17% as opposed to one point. 8% in uh, otherwise healthy individuals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the, the in, in the international scenario also, hypertension has been associated with, uh, the, the, has been most commonly associated with the, not only with the severity of disease, but also with the, uh, the uh, incidence of disease. And just I would like to uh, uh, mention here that, you know, not all cases, it's actually known, like say for hi hypertension, you know, for diabetes or for people with who are immunosuppressed due to cancer or chemotherapies, uh, we can realize that why they would have a, a disease uh, like uh, infectious disease, COVID-19, more severe, okay. uh, and particularly that is what is immune-associated uh, uh, disease. So, but uh, stay for hypertension. Uh, really, you know, this is still not established whether this is a, a coexistence or there is some cause and effect relations with the high incidence of. Uh, uh, hypertension associated with uh, COVID-19 uh, disease occurrence and severity. So this is, you know, still under, okay. you know, uh, okay. okay. So, 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 so yeah. hi hypertension is is one aspect which further perhaps needs a bit more study out there. Let me bring in Dr. Rohit Sarin here as well. Dr. Sarin uh, is a member of the National uh, Task Force on COVID. Uh, Dr. Sarin, uh, there must be some uh, guidelines being put in place, not only for the health workers who are attending to, you know, uh, COVID-19 patients with comorbidities, but also from the perspective of, uh, you know, the likely patients as well. Uh, people can go ahead and 
and you know uh, take care of uh, these comorbidities in in one way or the other so what are the uh, guidelines or norms per se to deal with comorbidity cases uh, which uh, ultimately also get infected with uh, covid-19 uh, thank you vishal uh well, you see, the thing is that, uh, as Dr. Das has uh, rightly said, that uh, whenever an individual has other diseases, whether it relates to the heart or to the lungs or to other organs of the body, the, we call that as a comorbid condition. And during these uh, comorbid conditions, the morbidity is more. That means the chance of further uh, destruction and symptoms is more as far as the individual is concerned. And uh, it is also more fatal. So the case fatality is high. Okay. Now, under these circumstances, if we talk of the guidelines, you see, normally in a normal individual, we have a classification of mild, moderate and severe COVID, which is, uh, you know, based on certain criteria, which relates to the oxygen saturation in the blood, as well as the rate at which one is breathing. And, uh, uh, you know, this uh, different criteria has uh, definitely different uh, managements. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like in a mild, we say that, uh, okay, you can only go to a COVID care center. If it is moderate, it is a COVID health center. And if it is severe, then uh, uh, one would require uh, hospitalization uh, for, uh, you know, different managements. Mm -hmm. Now, if, a, if an individual is in a, a comorbid condition, then one has to, uh, uh, of course, identify and uh, get uh, uh, information from the patient. Uh, if it's a known case uh, of, say, uh, asthma, bronchitis, tuberculosis, as far as the lungs is concerned, or uh, if it's hypertension, or if there are any cardiac arrhythmias per se, the individual is having. So the history of the patient becomes most important. And uh, okay. based, on, uh, based on that, the decision uh, uh, is taken that, well, this comorbidity exists. Okay. Now, once that is taken care of, then mm -hmm. obviously the management becomes more aggressive and monitoring of this patient is definitely much more important and it has to be closely monitored. Uh, if that is, uh, does not happen, then uh, the chances of mortality become even higher. Okay. When we talk of, you see, supplemental oxygen uh, given to this uh, group of patients, that also uh, has to be very closely monitored because the saturation may suddenly drop if there is already a pre-existing lung disease. Okay. And uh, 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 I would say that uh, uh, anyone who is comorbid, uh, we have to start management actively earlier than later. You know, okay. uh, in, in, uh, in a normal situation, as you say, that... Uh, uh, you, you see the individual uh, will recover on their own. But in there, a there's one more, one more aspect here, Dr. Sareen. We will come to that individual, uh, you know, part a bit later as well. But since you're talking about, you know, comorbid conditions, for our viewers to understand it better, you know, uh, Dr. Das spoke about hypertension as one major comorbid condition. You, you're uh, also mentioning uh, lung disease. So, what, which all diseases specifically do fall in that comorbid category or is it just, you know, that uh, if anybody has more than one, you know, health issue, that becomes a comorbid condition? Uh, you see, the, uh, uh, I think to understand this, it is, uh, you know, one has to be clear on uh, why it is that in comorbid situations, uh, uh, COVID has uh, greater morbidity and mortality. Okay. You know? So, uh, uh, the reason for that is that, uh, you know, COVID has uh, different phases in its, uh, 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 you know, uh, the uh, post-infection. So, after an individual gets infected, there is a stage of viremia, which is uh, followed uh, when the virus is multiplying very rapidly. Then this is followed by a stage of inflammation when uh, you see the body's own immune responses come into play. And subsequently, it is followed by a thromboembolic phenomena. So even when the virus has uh, gone away from the body, still mm -hmm. this thromboembolic phenomena goes away. So uh, 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 this thromboembolic phenomena continues. So you see an individual, because of this thromboembolic phenomena, if there is a cardiac disease pre-existing, then this um, uh, uh, you know, embolization taking place in the blood vessels will further aggravate the situation and one can have sudden death. 
Okay. Similarly, in the stage of inflammation, if the lung is already diseased and it is further compounded by more inflammation, then uh, definitely the, uh, the, the the aggressive management, if it's not there, the individual may not survive. So mm -hmm. um, these are primarily the organs. Now, when we talk of uh, other organs like the kidneys, you see, the uh, uh, even if there is kidney damage or liver damage uh, uh, for, due to any other disease, uh, that also is considered as a comorbid condition with COVID. Okay. However, the extent of damage there would be much less as compared to the extent of damage with comorbid conditions of the heart and the lungs. Okay. Uh, that is because of the patholo pathophysiology of this particular disease. Okay, so so basically vital organs uh, are the ones which, uh, you know, if uh, affected before the COVID-19 infection will fall into definitely the comorbid category as uh, both Dr. Sarin and Dr. Das are pointing out. Let me bring in uh, uh, Dr. Uh, you know, uh, Guttu here as well. Dr. Guttu, uh, from your point of view, from a clinician's point of view, one, how severe the comorbidity factor makes the COVID-19 disease one. And two, what exactly a doctor does on the ground, you know, uh, when uh, you have a COVID-19 patient with a comorbidity condition? Uh, as regards the first uh, question, there is a comorbidity or comorbidities and there is COVID infection. Two state variables, two parameters. Now, they interact with one another in a mutually reinforcing way. COVID makes comorbidity comor bad or worse. Comorbidity makes COVID outcomes adverse, more adverse than it, uh, than it would be otherwise. Mm -hmm. So between the two, the comorbidity and the COVID states, these two states, they mutually and reciprocally influence each other in an adverse manner and the outcomes get more adverse than they would otherwise have been, one. Okay. This, this interaction between comorbidity and COVID is set up against a larger backdrop of two other factors, primarily age, under 50, under 60, increasingly above 60, one, that determines, influences what the outcome would be like when they interact, mm -hmm. and second, treatments, what other drugs are they taking? Uh, steroids, yes, no. Other immunosuppressant medications, yes, no. So these two interactively framed against the larger backdrop of age, 60 less or more than 60 increasingly gets worse. Mm -hmm. And the treatments they are on, particularly immunosuppressants, steroids, and others. So this is the broad model of interactivity which creates the adversity of outcomes. One. The second question was, how do I approach uh, as a clinician, which we get every day, our patients here in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, when I get a patient, the first question I ask is, what are the risk stratifications okay. for this patient? Mm -hmm. Now, these risk stratifications, to sum up what Dr. Sarin said, uh, uh, we use three broad parameters. One, how severe is the COVID? As Dr. Sarin said, mild. Is it mild, moderate, severe? That we broadly do it very fast based on oxygen saturation and the respiratory rate mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes hemodynamic parameters as well. But usually oxygen saturation, uh, the pulse oximetry, 94 to 90%, moderate, 94 to 90% and less, severe. And the other hemodynamics, if that's disturbed, that goes critical. So okay. one, how severe is the COVID infection, mild, moderate, severe, one. The second stratification, risk stratification I do, we do, is how severe is the comorbidity? Let us take uh, diabetes, the glycemic status, the sugar, mm -hmm. as determined by your glucometer bedside. Is it uh, if the fasting or pre-meal is below 140 milligram percent, that's well controlled, if it's increasingly beyond 180 milligram percent, that requires insulin, and insulin is very important to manage acutely here. Uh, likewise, for for the after the meals, if it's uh, less than 180 degree, uh, one, 180 milligram percent, that's well adequately controlled. We are satisfied. Okay. As it goes above 200, 
we require insulin. So that way. So how severe is the comorbidity for co chronic asthma or chronic uh, lung diseases? We use uh, oxygen parameters. Mm -hmm. Likewise, so we classify how severe is the comorbidity. And the third parameter interactively we assess is the age factor. Okay. Is it under 60, more than 60? You know, these three aggregated together give us a sense of how bad or good is our patient. And then the step two is planning the diagnostics, that is the usual, and the management, the treatment, therapeutics. Okay. Here, the chief strategy we use is called optimization. Not the ideal, not the worst. Optimize between these three or four comorbidities and their severity, along with the COVID infection and its severity and the age. Okay. We optimize them and then decide a therapeutic plan and then monitor regularly and adapt and change as the situation unfolds. Okay, okay. One more, one more question here, uh, Dr. Guthu, before I move on to uh, the next phase of uh, the uh, discussion here. And that is, uh, from your experience on the ground there dealing with the COVID-19 patients, which are the most common, uh, you know, health disorders uh, which form uh, the, the, the comorbidity factor in COVID-19 patients? Uh, there are several, but since you have asked for one, I'll give you one which is the most common mm -hmm. and one which is the most neglected. One that is the most common and it is just not uh, a comorbidity, it's a force multiplier. It amplifies everything that follows and that is diabetes. Okay. Because diabetes is not alone ever. It's always co-associated with other comorbidities like hypertension, obesity, the weight around the stomach, the tummy uh, weight fat. Uh, so diabetes is okay. the force amplifier, which is most dangerous and life-threatening and requires our maximum attention, one. The most common. The second is uh, the most neglected, and that is mental health conditions, mm -hmm. which are extremely common, extremely neglected by us because we are not often trained in that. And remember that uh, unlike other comorbidities, mental health condition as a comorbidity associated with COVID leads to double burdens of double stigmatization. Once mm -hmm. one, that person is stigmatized as a COVID, unfortunately. And second, the double part is that he or she is also stigmatized as a mental person. Okay. So this is a double stigma. So these are overlooked and one has to be very, and they're very common. Okay. So these are the two extremes. I have uh, there are several others. I'll not go into them because okay. that would take a lot of your time. De definitely, you know, and and, and these uh, two also bring out a lot in terms of uh, the way comorbidities play a very very important role out there in making the situation either worse or perhaps giving us an insight into what needs to be done. Let's come to now what needs to be done from the patient's perspective or from an individual's perspective. Dr. Das, let me begin with you. In, in your views, what should a person perhaps needs to do? Somebody who has a comorbid uh, you know, condition uh, and, and, and knows about it as well. Uh, so, uh First of all, you know, if somebody is uh, having a comorbidity, whatever, so he should be, he or she should be uh, very careful about it, you know, taking the medicines, what are already there, so and control this. Like if somebody has hypertension, so make sure that the blood pressure is well controlled, or if somebody has diabetes, make sure that the, the blood uh, sugar is well controlled. So uh, maintaining the, the, or treating the comorbidities and keeping them, under control is the most important thing that they should do because you know if somebody it's very common that if somebody somebody comes to know that the, he has covid infection um, so the person tends to forget about the comorbid condition and you know the, uh, the entire focus goes on to covid so mm -hmm. the, the comorbid condition is gets neglected and gets aggravated and aggravates as uh, dr guttu has you know uh, nicely uh, elaborated that you know, uh, they mutually aggravate each other. So that's a very important thing. Second is that, you know, often there is a, there are a lot of misconceptions about, you know, what drugs to uh, continue uh, for comorbid conditions and not to continue. And you, you know, we all know about that um, angiotensin in converting enzyme mm -hmm. inhibitor. So, you know, so they have to be, so, so the, the patient should not on his or her own discontinue or discontinue any drug 
should take medical advice okay. you know, whether changes in treatment required or not so that's very uh, critical and uh, particularly so if somebody has a comorbid condition in my opinion uh, that this person uh, if having uh, the covid infection even if the infection is mild or mm-hmm. even asymptomatic the person should be under medical uh, supervision okay okay so, dr sir so, dr, dr. Okay. dr sarin your your views on on this aspect there you know people with comorbid conditions they need to be extra cautious but what more can they do i think they should not ignore uh, uh, you see even uh, the mildest symptoms uh, of covid so uh, uh, say uh, a person with comorbid conditions having a mild fever for a day should not ignore it and should move towards uh, early diagnosis of the infection so that is something uh, usually we may a- ignore it and then uh, secondly if sen- anyone is there with uh, uh, you see uh, respiratory issues uh, and uh, they find that okay the need for their medication has suddenly increased for no reason there again uh, you see they may start suspecting do i have covid and go for a test so okay. i think that is some something which uh, uh, a patient has to be very careful on and uh, uh, the uh, on part of the health system also one has to be very cautious because now uh, as uh, dr gurtu has said rightly that uh, you see there has to be a protocol uh, which every uh, doctor or institution needs to follow uh, you know uh, in evaluating the individual mm-hmm. and uh, uh, related to that uh, as i have already stated that early intervention with the say the management therapies that we give like uh, uh, oxygen therapy like giving corticosteroids that may happen earlier than in a person who does not have comorbidities okay. so the uh, yeah so the management from the health worker side or uh, the health provider side is uh, going to be more aggressive in such patients mm-hmm. and the patient has to be more cautious about uh, you see any symptoms and report to the health facility for diagnosis okay okay let me let me have uh, you know uh, the concluding comments from dr guthu as well dr guthu uh, from your perspective you know if you could uh, sum up the guiding principles for the individuals who know that they are they have comorbid conditions the main uh, set is that uh, one their thresholds for suspecting that something is wrong that signal that arises and tells us that our health is not okay today mm-hmm. that threshold has to be set a bit low for those who have comorbidities okay. one they must be aware of the fact uh, dr sarin just mentioned a very important point that suppose if i am diabetic and suddenly i see a spike emerge in my glucose control it suddenly goes bad it was okay and nothing i did not eat or do anything extra and yet i wake up in the morning with glucose going up to 300 all of mm-hmm. a sudden mm-hmm. now this now uh, because uh, in diabetics also and otherwise a large chunk almost okay. up to 90% certain populations are asymptomatics uh-huh. so when the, those people who are asymptomatics as they are in large chunks they develop uh, covid the only signal is a sudden worsening of their pre existing comorbidity a sugar okay. spike without any reason a sudden dip in my oxygen if okay. I, i if i have got chronic lung disease a sudden rise in my uh, blood urea if i have a chronic kidney disease uh, a sudden spike in my bilirubin if i have a chronic liver disease okay. likewise so that may alert that is the thing we have to be alerted to and at the first signal of fatigue sudden onset of fatigue Un- unexplained one okay. must go to the doctor and doctors must have a very low threshold okay. to test admit and treat these patients okay. as dr sarin said okay so there it is so we will have to leave it uh, there but as our panelists pointed out you know those uh, patients who know that they have comorbid conditions will have to look in for uh, the threshold limits uh, ensure that they taking regular medications for their existing conditions and also the health workers out there need to be a bit more aggressive on the management of patients covid-19 patients who already have comorbid conditions thank you so much uh, dr sarin out there dr gurthu as well as dr das for uh, sharing uh, those views with us on uh, this very important aspect of covid-19 but let me also remind our viewers here on the covid appropriate behavior and there are three simple things which all of us need to do 
one wear our masks always completely covering our face as well as nose wash our hands regularly at frequent intervals and also ensure that we maintain a physical distancing of at least six feet from each other these are some very simple steps to ensure protection of not only yourself but also your near and dear ones from covid 19 we'll come back again tomorrow with a different topic till then keep watching rajya sabha television